and wanted to do a, a, a quick, uh, but not too quick, intro of our amazing guest today. You guys, we are so lucky to have Seth Levin joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know Seth or, or haven't had a chance to, to see him speak before at, at any KW events, Seth is with our New York City office and he's in the top 1% of realtors nationwide. Uh, four years ago, Seth joined Keller Williams with his team, the Levin Kong team, after 13 years at another top Manhattan real estate firm. At Seth's previous company, he held company-wide ranking in the top 20 out of over 5,000 agents and earned the highest award, the Pinnacle Award. So we are, we are dealing with someone who definitely knows his stuff. Uh, Seth is a member of the International Agent Leadership Council, and since affiliating with KW New York City, uh, they've been consistently a top performing team. Uh, Seth's also a prominent member of the Keller Williams Luxury Division, a featured panelist, speaker, and often quoted on real estate. Uh, Seth is a true advocate for his clients. His marketing and negotiation tactics put him in the top of his field. And for more than a decade and a half, Seth has earned a reputation for achieving record-breaking prices for his sellers and finding strong value and investment opportunities for his buyers. Because of his careful and personalized attention to detail, the majority of his clients are repeat business or referrals who enthusiastically share his referral, his name as a referral to all their friends and family. We are just so excited to have you. We know what an incredible asset you are, not only to your team, but to our KW family in New York City. Um, and we're excited to have you share with us your tips and tactics on negotiating because Seth, you sell some pretty expensive property in New York City, don't you? We do. Um, so, you know, I always say that new, in New York City, because people have a different idea of what luxury property is by price point in different parts of the country, but every aspect, every segment of our of our market is luxury because, you know, we have buyers buying $1 million studio second homes. That is a luxury. And, you know, people are buying just regular bread and butter, two and a half million dollar, two bedroom family homes, three bedroom, three million dollar homes. And that's sort of the average. Um, but that being said, we have at this moment, we have a $485,000 listing. We're working with buyers up to about 10 million right now. Um, I think it was four years ago. At the same time, I had an $18 million listing. I had a $300,000 listing. And I chose to do the open house for the $300,000 listing that day and let somebody else do the 18 million. Wound up selling that directly that day, getting another listing in the building, meeting a father of the first time home buyer who gave me his $8 million listing that we sold on Central Park. So I truly believe in being in every segment of the market and my mantra is business begets business. So I roll up my sleeves and I really do, I'm in production and I handle every aspect of my business. And sometimes it's the low, you know, the lower numbers that lead to the most business. So we're not pigeonholing ourselves in any segment of the market. Yeah, I love hearing that Seth. And I think it's important for our agents in Austin um, and some of our visitors who are with us as well to really hear that and take that in. Um, it is it is important, especially in a tech environment like Austin, that we don't judge any book by its cover or by how much money that they're spending because you never know who they're friends with. You never know who their parents are. You never know what they're going to buy two years from now when they hit the lottery in the tech world in Austin. Um, so business begets business. I love that, Seth. Thank you for sharing. And I'll piggyback off of that because we're, I mean, we're a tech hub as well. Uh, Facebook just leased 730,000 square feet in mid Midtown Manhattan. Uh, Google, um, Apple, I mean, everybody's got their second, at, right now it's becoming their primary. Um, you know, a lot, Google has more employees here than anywhere else. And um, funny story, I had a listing on the Upper West Side in 2005. 2004, whenever Google went public, 2005, 2006. And there was a guy who came to my listing in jean cutoffs and a ratty tank top. And he turned out to be one of the first 10 guys into Google. And him and his partner bought that very, very high ticket item. So you, we never judge our you know books by their cover or the, like you said, the son could have a father who's you know got an $8 million place on Central Park West. So we just never know. But um, so I-, I Truly, yeah, that, you know. that, that tech that tech uh, dress code 
is a little different than what we used to expect in the financial world and in Wall Street. Um, the, they don't quite dress the same. And, and we see a lot of that here in Austin at our most expensive restaurants, you'll see people in flip-flops and shorts and t-shirts. And um, yes, it's important to understand that it's, it's not always about that. Um, and it is a really important thing to understand that every piece of business that people have leads to others when you service them well, no matter what the price point, right? Exactly. I've had $300,000 buyers refer me to their $5 million you know, seller friends. So, uh, so one of the things that I love since I came over to Keller Williams is the collaborative nature. It's the sharing. Um, I was at Douglas Elliman in Manhattan, you know, very sort of high end, you know, big cachet here in New York. Um, and it was a very cutthroat, very competitive environment. Um, I had friends in the company that would come to me to help me to help them come up with negotiation strategies. But in general, we kept everything under lock and key. So when I first came over to Keller Williams, um, actually, uh, you know, we met with Chris Heller a bunch. We flew out to Austin and we went to a mega camp. And I was like, oh, my God, the world is so much bigger than this little, you know, this little pond where, you know, we're a big fish in a little pond here. And then, you know, this is huge. And the collaborative nature, the running a business as opposed to being, you know, transactional, I always knew just inherently that it was a relationship business, but I didn't run it like a business. Um, so we came over and one of the first things I was asked, um, you know, because I was one of the founding members of the Keller Williams Tribeca Market Center, I was asked to develop a class. And I said, you know what, negotiation is by far, after a decade and a half in this business, still the thing that really intrigues me and, you know, it's very, you know, invokes a lot of passion in me. So let me come up with a negotiation class. And as I was writing it, I felt weird, like I'm giving away all my trade secrets. But what I found is by teaching this class, I've actually become better and better at negotiating. And the more I teach, the more I pay attention to what I'm doing. Um, so it doesn't matter how advanced you are. There's always stuff to learn. Sharing is reciprocal. And I've learned so much since coming over here. And, um, you know, the referral nature of this company as well, it's just so collaborative. It's, it's incredible. Um, at Douglas Allman, you know, fabulous company, have no, nothing disparaging to say about it, but I was there for 13 and a half years. I think I got maybe two or three agent referrals. I probably got about six this week from Keller Williams. So it's, I mean, it's just a very different culture and, and I love it. Um, so we came over in 2016 at sort of the height of our New York City market. Um, it was a peak post the downturn. We sort of went from 2011 to 2016. Uh, 2017, our luxury market started faltering, um, but the first time home buyer market was really very strong. Um, so we actually expanded to Queens and Long Island in 2018 to capture some of the tangential market off of New York City. Um, we were sales team of the year 2016, 17, and 18. Last year we were number two. Um, so you know, we've done a fair amount of business in New York for for a long time, and um, you know, this is a city where negotiating is super important as it is everywhere, but we're negotiating with people that have Harvard MBAs, for people that have Harvard MBAs. And, um, you know, it's very important to just really pay attention to what you say. And um, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Prior to real estate, I actually went to school for policy. I was the national campaign coordinator for one of the largest student organizations in the, in the country and the world. Got into non-government work after college, lived in San Francisco, came back to the East Coast to be co closer to my family, started working for a friend's family's gemstone importing company. And it's not like diamonds and rubies like that, that are cut. We were actually importing museum quality gemstones. So through that, I was traveling to India, to Africa, all through South America. And you know, one thing that I learned was that you know, everybody's trying to obviously get to the point that it, you know, fulfills their goal in a negotiation, but everybody does it differently. So we really have to be mindful of people who are coming from different perspectives. It doesn't mean that the person that comes in at 1 million, you're not gonna be able to get them up to 1.4. So we always welcome everybody into a negotiation where basically my, what I say is the water's warm, come on in. We're never trying to push people away. We're never trying to create a high pressure environment. You know, 
people think that my brother is a general counsel, the uh, billion dollar valued startup. Before that, he was um, general counsel, chief legal officer of publicly traded companies. The way he negotiates is very different than the way we negotiate in real estate. We're trying to bring people in. We're trying to make people comfortable. This is oftentimes it's you know a very personal, very important transaction. Sometimes it's their first. Sometimes it's the most expensive thing that they'll ever be party to. So you know we're trying to make people comfortable here. Um, and I you know was talking about my brother real quick, so I'll tell this story. Um, he was the general counsel for one of the two biggest media research companies in the world. The other one. The other biggest of the two they were merging and my brother and i were on the golf course and he said seth i got to take a couple of holes off i've got to negotiate here and i was you know golfing but i was also listening he got off the, the call and i said when he said that it was because you had had said this um you said this because you really had this amount of resources that you were able to to offer and he said oh was that on speaker i said no i just would have said the exact same thing given you know that you know, that tool chest, that, you know, toolbox. So, you know, it's just intrinsic for me to negotiate. I've been doing it since I was a little kid. I negotiated with teachers, I negotiated with my parents and they'd always say, Seth, it's not a negotiation. And I'd say, you know what, I'm not negotiating. But if I can go back in time, I would say, everything's a negotiation. I'm negotiating, but I'm gonna lose this negotiation. You know, everything is a negotiation. We don't always win but everything is a negotiation. Every time you're talking to your client, you're negotiating. Every time you're talking to the agent on the other side, you're actually starting the negotiation. Before they even see the property, you should be laying the breadcrumbs to get them to where you want them to be in a future negotiation. So we're always negotiating. Um, this job is twofold. We're detectives to try to tap into people's motivation to understand where they're coming from, and we're negotiators. We're trying to figure out what motivates people so that we can best negotiate with them. And oftentimes we're negotiating with people to get them to do what's in their best interest. We're certainly negotiating constantly with our clients. So um, sort of alluded to it, um, you know, I consider myself a natural when it comes to negotiation. There's people that start at different levels in negotiation. But you know, I always say that I wish I can go back and reinvent my golf swing with a teacher when I was 13 years old, instead of having all the bad habits. So I think learned is oftentimes much better than natural because natural, you oftentimes hit your ceiling and because you were so adept, you don't go past that natural ceiling, which is why I mentioned before that by teaching this class, I've actually honed my skills. I paid attention to where I pause when I ask a question, what question I ask when I'm speaking with somebody on the other side of a transaction or with one of my clients. So I would certainly say, regardless of your level of negotiation skill, and oftentimes I talk to people and they say, I love this job, but I'm so afraid of negotiation. And I say, well, you better become unafraid of negotiation because that's what this job is. Um, you know, we're not just taking people and looking at, at homes, we're helping them find value and we're helping them get the most out of their asset, out of their real estate assets. So negotiation is part of everything we do in real estate and you know, we really wanna hone our skills. So um, you know, why do we wanna hone our skills? Why do we wanna become better negotiators? Um, you know, first and foremost, our commission. I think that that is the most important negotiation that we have. Um, I am in New York City, I'm in Manhattan, but we also work in Brooklyn, we work in Queens, and we work in Long Island. My business is mostly centered in Manhattan though. Um, in Manhattan, we're really going for 6% commissions. That's, that's you know, really the, uh, the, the goal of every listing presentation, every appointment we go on is to try to explain why offering that 6% commission is in their best interest. But before we get to their best interest, you know, why, is it in our best interest? Let's say we go on 100 listing appointments per year. Let's say we offer 5% commission to everybody. We just cut our income by 17%. Let's say we take 100 listings and we lose seven of those because we were firm about our commission. We only lost 7% of our income. So there's a 10% gap between cutting your commission 
and being true to yourself and true to the value that you give your client, you're not actually losing money by turning down certain business or, or being firm in your, in your value. You're actually going to make more money. Um, I've, I've been in the business for 18 years. I'm going to be in the business for at least 18 more. Every time that I cut my commission, you know, I'm starting a, a trend that's going to lead to me making less money per transaction. So it's really important for us to prove our work, to explain to our clients that it's actually in their best interest to offer a full commission. Um, I used to, when I first got into the business, I had some, some people that told me, oh, the best way to get commission is to explain to them all the expenses you have. Explain to them that you've got to share with your office, you've got to pay for marketing, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Another thing people told me to say was, you know, tell them if you cut your commission, how good could you be at working for them? So I have actually learned that both of those are not the route that I want to take to get higher commissions because both of those are about me. We negotiate with clients by tapping into their motivations and figuring out what's going to be best for them. So why is it better for them to pay 6% than 5%? That's counterintuitive. But I explained to them that you want to offer the full commission because your first and most important piece of marketing to the brokerage community is the commission. I also explained that I used to work for the relocation department of my former company. And oftentimes we had an executive come in, they were gonna buy an apartment, they had one day, we were gonna show them 10 properties. I cherry picked the properties based on what was best for them. But there's a lot of agents out there that cherry pick based on what's best for them them being the agent. So we want to put up the strongest piece of marketing with no chinks in the armor right from the get-go. We want to sell this for the most money in the shortest period of time. 95% of the time, we're going to do it with another agent on the other side. So we want to offer them the full commission. This is not about me. This is about attracting more people, creating more competition, and doing what's best for the seller. Because the seller doesn't care about you goal is the seller cares about you somewhere down the transaction, somewhere during the relationship, enough to refer you to somebody else and enough to use you again. But when you're going in to talk to them, you have to take away the idea that they care about you. They care about maximizing their asset and you're explaining to them why offering 6% commission helps them maximize their asset. Um, also, you know, when we're dealing with the client, first time we talk to a buyer, especially first time we talk to a seller, we're overcoming objections. So you'll hear objection handling all the time. You'll never hear that from me. What you're going to hear from me is speaking to concerns. We're finding out what somebody's concerns are and we're speaking to it. We have to stop thinking about batting away people's objections like a tennis racket, hitting them away because they're going to come back to us until we actually deal with somebody's concerns, understand what their motivation is, that's gonna be lingering in the background forever. So from my perspective, it's less about handling objections as it is speaking to concerns. Like if somebody's concern is, I've got a contract on a place in Florida, I need this to close within two weeks, I also can't take a price under here, I know what they need. And I'm not going to concentrate on something that they don't need throughout the process. We're trying to find out what is important to them so that we can speak to it. And then during the transaction, during the negotiation with the uh, potential purchaser on the other side, we're actually doing what's best for them, not what we think is best for them. Because different people come from a different perspective as to why they're selling their property. Somebody's been in the, prop the property for 20 years. Every squeezing every last dollar out of the property might not be as important to them as finding somebody that really loves their home and doing it quickly because they want to move on. Um, my brother, um, my other brother bought a property um, in Manhattan through me uh, 2014, I believe. It was really a competitive market. And the seller, he lost his wife in 9-11 and his twin son and daughter were about to go away to college. We made an offer about 10% under ask in a super competitive market, but you know, we just wanted to come in and op make an opening offer. He accepted it. He accepted it because my brother had two small daughters and it reminded him of when he bought the property and he had his two daughters. So we always have to remember that people are coming from different perspectives and we need to ask questions 
so that we can negotiate properly both with them and for them. So it's not overcoming objections as much as it's listening to people and understanding what their concerns are. Um, then, of course, we want to get better results. Better results for our clients leads to more business for us. I'm in a vertical market. I know Austin has a lot of condo property as well. Um, last year, I took over a property that was on the market with another agent for about a year. Um, it was 80 John Street down in the financial district. It was on the market for 1.15, I believe, for about a year. We took it over. We didn't lower the price, but we did revamp the marketing. We reached out to the usual suspects, the agents in the neighborhood, and we sold it for 1.15 in one week. I'm in the elevator doing the walkthrough, and I bump into who, uh, someone who turns out to be a seller. This was apartment 4B. I bump into the guy who's got 8B in the building. He says, I can't believe you sold that in a week. Will you come look at my property? I said to him, I know we got 1.15, but I think we can get 1.25 for your property. We put it on for 1.25. We got 1.25 in about two weeks. We wound up getting about seven more listings in that building. So business begets business. Your results are your resume. We're doing what's best for our clients. We're trying to prove to them from the get-go that our goals and motivations are in line. We're trying to prove to our clients from the get-go that our goals and motivations are in line. That is hugely important. A lot of times they think that we wanna take the listing, sell it as quickly as possible and don't care about the price. I wanna to explain to them that I've been in this business for a long time. We have a robust business because we do what's best for the clients, because our goals are in alignment. We wanna get the top dollar possible because that is our resume. I'm very transparent with my clients. I tell them that not only do I care about you and wanna get you the top dollar, but getting top dollar for you gets me more business. People respect that when you tell them the truth, especially when your truth is in line with their motivation. So it's very important that they understand that we have the same goals. And once we prove that to them, they're way more trusting when we say we need to make a price reduction or we need to take this off the market for a month, bring it back with a new paint job, staging. They understand that it's not because you're trying to make your job easier, but because you're trying to achieve the highest results just like them. And what happens when we achieve the highest results, we get more business. So truly our goals are in alignment with our clients. We, we cannot forget that. And on that note, I know this is not negotiation, but this is a side point. Some of my best referrals and most incredible business has come from me telling people not to buy or telling people maybe this is not the market for you to sell in. And then they refer me to somebody in their building that needs to sell and then I get their listing. So we're not trying to push people to do things that are not in their interest. I mean, if you wanna be in this business for a year and you wanna get as many deals done in that one year, do what's best for you. If you want to be in this business for a long time and you want a business that grows and you want to build a business that's based in referrals, you got to do what's best for the clients, even if that's not necessarily what's best for you. Um, so I always thought of negotiation as, you know, two people trying to beat each other up and one person taking advantage of the other person or, or getting one over on the other person. You know, when I was younger, that was what I thought negotiation was. Having been in business for a long time, I've realized that that's not the case. It's a lot of it is compromise. A lot of it is understanding what's important and going after what's important and letting some other things slide. Um, but I do really like Keller Williams definition of negotiation, which is on the screen, you guys can read it, but negotiation is bargaining between two or more parties, each with its own aims, needs, and viewpoints, seeking to discover a common ground and reach an agreement to settle a matter of mutual concern or resolve a conflict. You know, I really, take the end of that definition and sort of incorporate it into my own to settle a matter of mutual concern. You know, the fact that it's mutual, I think is very important. Um, you know, one person is trying to buy a property. One person is trying to sell a property. There is a value that the market sort of puts on property. We're not just making it up. So we need to do research. We need to understand what is possible. And certainly I'm trying to achieve the highest that the market will bear, or if I'm working with a buyer, um, for instance, I just got a accepted offer yesterday for 910,000 on a new development in Brooklyn that was asking a million fifty pre-COVID and the mirror image unit went into contract close to a million. We got it for 910 
with the seller paying transfer taxes, which were about 2%, and paying for the attorney fees and some other closing costs. So, you know, the markets, markets are dynamic, pricing is fluid. So we're always trying to justify what, you know, what we're going for within the market. Um, but I whittle negotiation down to this. We're figuring out what motivates who you're talking to, and we're connecting to their motivation in order to maximize your position. I'm done. The class is over. We're trying to connect to people's motivation to figure out how to maximize your position. Um, you know, again, I go back to the example of we go in thinking that it's always about sales price. It's not always about sales price for everybody. Some people, it's about ease of trans transaction. Some people, it's about terms. They have, an, they have an accepted offer in Florida that's contingent on financing or that's not contingent on financing, sorry. They need this to be sold without a mortgage contingency because they can't risk this deal not happening. Then they lose 10% on their deposit in Florida. So we really have to understand what is important to people. Um, we have to understand when we're talking to people on the other side of the transaction, what's important to them. We're trying to uncover what motivates them whether it's school district, whether it's price point, we need to understand as much as we can about people on the other side as humanly possible. Um, I don't know, um, Diane, I can see you. Um, Jen, I can see you. Mallory, I can see you. So if you three can nod at me, do you show your own properties, your own listings, or is it just in luxury or is it the entirety of the market? Show them by appointment, you mean? Yeah, or is the listing agent, how often is the listing agent at the, at the showing? I think more generally in luxury, we do appointment by agent. More often, it's a, it's a go and show sort of situation or set an appointment with the owner for them to leave here in Austin. Okay, so some of what I'm going to be saying, you're going to try to do that over the telephone. Um, we are at each of our showings because we have you know, doorman buildings, there always needs to be a rep represent, re representative of the seller at the showing. So I don't walk around pointing out window treatments. I don't walk around pointing out crown moldings. I don't point out the sub-zero refrigerator. I don't point out the tile in the kitchen. I'm asking questions. And if you're scheduling appointments, you should ask the questions on the telephone. You should plant the seeds for the future negotiation on the telephone. You should remove negatives on the telephone. And if you're doing this in person, you should certainly be asking questions. Obviously, you know, a seasoned agent might deflect some of those questions from the buyer, or they might not answer those questions, but our goal is to get as much information as possible. I'll give, a, I'll give an example of this. Um, I think it was 2018, I had a listing on the Upper East Side. These are people that I knew incredibly well. I had sold the wife, when she was single, a studio apartment in Gramercy. I had sold that apartment for them together when they got married. They had bought this two bedroom apartment on the Upper East Side through me as well. They got pregnant. They thought they would stay there for a little bit. Turns out they're having twins. They decided maybe it was a good time to move to Long Island. And we put the place on the market and you know, I did the comparative market analysis and I came up with a price of 1.45 million. The market was pretty balanced at the time. It wasn't a robust seller's market. It wasn't a buyer's market. It was pretty, pretty fair market. So when it's a fair market, I like to price on the money. When it's a seller's market, I actually like to price a little bit below to get a bidding war. And when it's a buyer's market, like we're in right now in New York, I like to build in a little fat. So if the average discount in Gramercy, two bedroom condos is 6%, I wanna build in that 6% because everybody's expecting to push it down. So this is a balanced market. I wanted to price right on the money, 1.45. So um, Dorothy and John, very good friends of mine at this point, um, they wanted to try for 1.55. They said, you know what? We're not in a rush. Let's see what we can do. And this is removing negatives before they come up. I'm gonna have a price reduction conversation with them while we're signing the exclusive. If we don't get an offer in two weeks that's accepted, we're going to drop the price to the price that I thought was the right price. Um, and we're doing this for two reasons. So we don't have to have that conversation with them later, but also we're removing the negative, which is the price reduction. We're making it a step in the process that's built in. You know, we're trying to system, systematize everything. We're trying not to have 
combative conversations when they come up or trying not to pull the wool over people's eyes and then say, oh, we need to make a price reduction now. We're always trying to remove the negatives before they come up. So we did an open house, we got an accepted offer, contract goes out, um, I think a little bit over 1.4, 1.425. Those people back out. We go back on the market, we do another open house, we get another offer, I think it was about the same, 1.45 send out a contract, that one falls through. Now we're on day 13 of the listing, average days on market at this time period for a two bedroom co-op in the Upper East Side is 20 days. I'm always trying to do things based on the average days on market, average discount, you know, we're research based, we're trying to build these things into the benchmarks in the transaction. So day 13, they actually call me and they say, Seth, before you call us, we know you're gonna ask for a price reduction. And I say, actually, in this case, I think we need to hold a couple days because there's another party that's been circling around. Let me call the agent, get them back into the apartment before we do a price reduction because we don't want to negotiate against ourselves when I think we're getting another offer. So they come in, young couple with a seven-year-old daughter, and I'm asking questions. Their agent at the time was the top three agent for Corcoran in the United States. She was not a very, you know, she was not unsophisticated by any means, but she let me ask them questions. I asked them, are you only looking in the Upper East Side? They said, no, we're only looking in this school district, PS4. Okay, I'm making a mental note. They only look in this specific block radius. Then I said, are you looking up to only 1.5, 1.6? No, we're looking up to about 1.8. So now I know their price point. So I know two huge pieces of information and I can extrapolate a third. The first piece of information is their price. The second piece of information is their, um, their radius. And the third piece is their motivation. They need to be in school. They need to be in this apartment in July. Otherwise they miss the cutoff to get into that school district. So I know that they're looking up to 1.8 in this, this radius and they need to close by July. We were in May. Co-ops take about two months to close in Manhattan. So I knew if they were gonna buy this property, they were gonna buy it in the next couple of days. I went to my computer, I looked, we were the only two bedroom in PS4 under 1.8 million. I called the agent and I said, due to the level of demand on this property, we're going to best and final with a deadline of 5 p.m. on Thursday. The level of demand was them. I did a best and final with just them and we achieved a price of 1.585. We broke a record for a two bedroom in the building because we asked questions because we tapped into motivation. We wound up changing the price dynamics for that building. Every two bedroom from there on out traded above 1.55. So not only did we help the client, but we helped the building and we got more business from it. And we did it by asking questions, by tapping into motivation to understand who we were dealing with, what their time frame was. So you're not just going into every negotiation with the same tool belt. You're trying to figure out who you're talking to and that will allow you to know what you're able to achieve. You know, in a, in a buyer's market, you're not gonna be able to do that. So you have to understand the market, you have to do your research and understand who you're dealing with. Every negotiation is different. Pricing doesn't exist in a vacuum. Markets don't exist in a vacuum. You'll hear me say this all the time. Markets are dynamic, pricing is fluid. That's how I open my conversation with my sellers. That's how I open my conversation with my buyers. Then I start to show them the research that helps them, you know, the breadcrumbs that helps them make informed decisions for themselves. We're actually trying to make them understand what's going on so they make the decisions, not us. I tell stories. I tell stories of other people's successes that leads a trail for them to make the right decision. We never say, hey, dummy, you need to stage the apartment. We say, oh, let me show you these examples of people that stage their apartment and how they beat the market by an average of 6%. And they say, oh, I wanna beat the market by 6%. We're not telling them you need to stage, you need to paint, you need to fix the driveway, whatever, whatever the case may be. We're saying, you know, Sellers that we worked with in the past that had successful results, they fixed their driveway and they sold on average X amount of days quicker, whatever it is. We're trying to guide them to make the best decisions for themselves. So um, I think I 
actually a missing one, but um, when do we um, when do we start negotiating? We start negotiating at first contact with everybody. So when we're speaking with buyers, you know, obviously we want to see a buyer in person. That's harder in COVID during COVID. Um, but in general, we find that we're speaking with our buyers um, before we, okay, here's, here it is. Um, we're speaking with our buyers um, before we ever talk to them. We're speaking with them on the telephone. So what do we do and what do I teach my agents on my team to do when we're having our first conversation with our buyers? Have a cheat sheet with all the different market stats. How are we negotiating with our buyers these days? They've got Zillow, they've got access to a lot of information. When I first got into the business in the early 2000s, they did not have access to all that information. So we were the gatekeepers to all that information. Now we're trying to negotiate that we know things that they don't know, plus we have relationships with the brokerage community. It's going to help them get the properties that they want, help them compete against other potential buyers. And what we do is we have certain things that we always start our conversations with, whether it's a buyer or a seller, because we're, we're figuring the first time we talk to them is on the telephone. Um, we're looking at supply. We're looking at demand. We're looking at change in supply and change in demand month over month, year over year. We're extrapolating that to figure out market pulse. This is huge. Your clients don't know market pulse. You might not know market pulse. Market pulse is the percent of active supply in a micro market in a market segment that's in contract, that's pending. So for instance, one bedroom co-op apartments in Chelsea, 76% of them are in contract. Two bedroom condo and financial district, 9% is in contract. So, you know, it's not just one market. We're trying to fit, pick out different pieces of the market. We're trying to understand ways that they can take advantage of the market and show them our value. So there's other things, days on market, um, month, monthly supply. There's a bunch of different things that, but Market Pulse is the one that's worked the most beneficial for, for me and for my clients. Um, so just again, it's the amount of pending divided by the supply. So if you have 25 units in contract out of 100, your market pulse is 0.25. If you have 75 in contract out of 100, your market pulse is 75. So I'm a, I'm a storyteller by nature, but I also negotiate through stories. So I had a client, I put her in a one bedroom co-op in um, Chelsea in 2007. She got married uh, two years ago, about a year ago, I was speaking with her and she mentioned that she was pregnant. And I said, wow, that one bedroom in Chelsea, well, after I said, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. I said, wow, that one bedroom apartment in Chelsea is gonna become really small. I know how much you love that apartment, but you know, it is, there's no way to convert that to a two bedroom. Like, it's a very, you know, sort of normal cookie cutter um, layout. So I said, we should probably start talking about your next move. And she said, you know what, Seth, I know the market is terrible. I don't want to sell in this market. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have the baby. We'll see if we can get by. And then, you know, when the market turns around, we'll look into selling. And I said, Elizabeth, um, let me come over to your apartment on Thursday at 7 p.m. And let me just show you some market stats and talk to you about a strategy. So I knew that she wanted to ideally get a three bedroom condo in Manhattan. And she wanted to ideally sell her one bedroom co-op in Chelsea. So I showed her the market pulse, 0.76 for one bedroom co-ops in Chelsea. She thought it was in a buyer's market throughout the entirety of the city. No, her micro market, her market segment was 0.5 is balanced. Six months of inventory is balanced. She was 0.76 with three months of inventory. She was in the rare elusive seller's market in Manhattan last year. So then I showed her the three bedroom condo market in Manhattan and the average, or sorry, the, the aggregate for all of three bedroom Manhattan uh, market pulse was 0.22. So she had an amazing arbitrage opportunity, sell in a seller's market and buy in a buyer's market. 
So we put our place on the market for 1.2. We achieved 1.2. We did that in about two weeks. It was a co-op. She was looking for a condo. So we still had time to find her property since it took about two and a half months to close. While looking, I exposed her to Park Slope neighborhood in Brooklyn, right near Prospect Park, great schools, very family oriented. She loved it. The market pulse for three bedroom condos in Park Slope at that point was like 0.15, even better. So only 15% of active inventory was in contract. Then we looked at a new construction. The new construction market was even more favorable towards buyers. It was a $4 million listing that had been reduced to 3.5. We got it for 2.75. She sold her place for 1.25 and she bought something that was originally 4 million for 2.75. Were my negotiations with the buyer and seller in that important? Yes. What was more important, negotiating with my client, how markets are fluid and the pricing is dynamic in different markets within the general market of New York. Um, we need to be able to do that with people the first time we talk to them. Negotiation begins at first contact. Um, I think it was three years ago, I got a listing at 111 East 75th Street on the Upper East Side. We listed it for one point, also I think it was 1.2 million. That was apartment 4A. Apartment 8A had sold the year before for $750,000, four flights higher, clearing the building across the way. Because that block between Park and Lexington, everything is five stories. Um, except for this building happened to be about 13 stories. So it went over most of the buildings across the street, the eighth floor. Um, I did some due diligence. I spoke to people in the building. I found out that that was a father selling to a child. And that was the lowest price that the co-op would allow the transaction to happen at. So instead of just accepting that 750, I did my research. So now when people call to make the appointment, I say, you're a good agent. I'm sure you did your homework. Apartment 8A, I'm sure you saw closed for 750. The reason that happened was because it was a, a parent selling to a child and it was the lowest price. So what did I do? I removed the negative. I planted seeds for a future negotiation and I flattered the agent. The agent did not do their research before making the appointment. They never do. But I'm saying, you're a good agent. I'm sure you did your homework. I'm sure you saw that 750 was what 8A sold for. So I complimented them, you know, flattery does everything. We need to be amicable. We're trying to, the water's warm, come on in. We're never trying to push people away. So another thing that I do is right now I have a $2.4 million listing in Chelsea, um, 2,100 square foot, three bedroom condo. That should be about 3.8 million, but all of the Southern facing exposures face a brick wall. There's one Western exposure that's open, but it faces a brick wall. So we're priced at about 1,200 a square foot instead of about 18 or 1,900 a square foot. So every time I'm making an appointment, I tell them, you know, we're priced incredible value. You're not going to find a three bedroom apartment for under two and a half million in Chelsea, but because of this brick wall, you are. So as soon as people come into the showing and I'm doing the showings, I pull people over and I say, guys, look at this amazing view. And they say, what? It's a brick wall. I said, you've heard of a million dollar view? This is a million and a half dollar view. So what am I doing? A, I'm having a little fun with them. I'm making it comfortable, but I'm also removing that so that they don't use that brick wall against me later in a negotiation. We're removing the negative at first contact. We're first contact negotiating with our clients. We're first contacting negotiations with potential buyers, with potential sellers and agents on the other side. Never let your guard down. You know, like I am not a high stress person. I don't know if you can tell that, like I'm pretty friendly with people, but I'm paying attention to everything everybody is ever saying in a real estate context. And Seth, you know what? I was born in New York um, and I recognize the background noise, but I bet you become, um, I bet you become, um, you just don't hear that anymore, do you? These are very expensive noise canceling windows. So I'm certain that that is, a, a, <laughs> You know, really, really loud outside. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right, I'm going to mute myself again. <laughs> and, and one of the benefits of facing a brick wall is you don't do <laughs> anything. So you know, we're we're, we're removing the negatives. We're, we're you know, I love it. Painting things as a benefit. You know, some people call it spin, but it's not spin. We're 
gently pointing out you know, value because there's trade-offs in every market, in particular in New York. You know, you're high in a building, you're paying a lot for that view. You might only get one bathroom versus two for the same price point. So it's a city of trade-offs and real estate is a world of trade-offs. So we're trying to say, you know, for this, you're giving up that. For this, you're getting that. So, you know, that's the negotiation that we're, we're starting with. And, um, you know, what are the most important things in a negotiation? So, I always say that I should not have to say this, but I do. The most important thing in a negotiation is not to lie. Not to lie. We don't lie. There's so much available information out there. We need to do our homework and find things that help advance our point, that help us you know, advance our goals. We don't lie. I'm a storyteller, I'll tell another story. Um, I was at Douglas Solomon. I had an office next to a colleague of mine in our Greenwich Village office downtown. Um, she's one of the top agents in the company, actually one of the top agents in the city. So we had the best part of the office and we shared a hallway. And we would oftentimes go in the hallway and just sort of you know, chat about what was going on in our business, just bounce things off of each other. And I mentioned that I made an offer on 151 West 17th Street, a two bedroom apartment. And she said, oh, that's funny. We made an offer on it as well. And I said, oh, what did you make an offer? She said, oh, we made an offer of 1.8. I said, oh, that's funny. I came in at 1.725. Our top number is 1.8. She said, oh, don't worry. We're moving on. We already told the agent we rescinded the offer. We've moved on. I called the agent and I said, you know, I just wanted to follow up on our offer of 1.725. He said, you know, it's, it's, thank you for your offer, but we have an offer of 1.8 actually from one of your colleagues. And I said, oh, you do? Interesting. So it seems like that person's going to get it because we don't see value on this apartment that high. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at other properties, but we do really like this one. And I never closed the door. This is something I never close the door. I'm never take it or leave it. You know, we're walking, we're walking, but you can, you can still find us as long as we don't go into contract on something else. So we're, you know, we're saying to them, and I said to this, this agent, you know, we're going to continue looking. There's plenty of inventory that they like. We may make an offer elsewhere, but until we do, we're more than happy to transact with you. I get a phone call. You know, we lost the other offer. Um, we'd love for you to transact. And I said, you know what? We only see value up to 1.75. We see value up to. Remember that. We, in order to transact on this, in order to transact on this, remember that. We need this to be at 1.75. We don't say, do you think we can get it done at 1.75? Because what are they going to say? No. We say in order to get this done, we need it to be at 1.75. That's where we see value up to based on X, Y, and Z. We're supporting our point with data and we're not asking, we're telling. We got it for 1.75. We were willing to go up to 1.8, but because he lied, we took advantage of that and we put the fear of him having to go back to his seller and saying, I lost both. I knew, what's his motivation? Not losing both. So all of a sudden we turned him around, which is the ultimate goal and made him an agent working for us. So now we had three people working against one. We had my buyer, me and the seller's agent working against the seller to get our deal done because he did not want to lose two, you know, two, two potential transactions. So we're always trying to figure out what's going on with somebody else. So that's one that's not even one of my musts, but listen more than you speak is number one, it's all about extracting information. We are detectives. Being a good detective is finding out information. Real estate agents love to talk. You find out nothing by talking. You can ask questions, but make sure you listen to the answers. <laughs> I, I shouldn't have to say that, but oftentimes you know, people ask questions and then they start talking. We're really trying to uncover information here. Um, be confident. I just said this. Don't ask. Say we need. And, you know, like we're looking at market pulse. We're looking at average price per square foot. I'm conveying that to the other side. 
I'm saying, you know, we need this to be 1.75 million or below in order to get this done. And then I'm following up my conversation with an email. And what am I doing? I'm assuming that the email is getting passed along to the seller or the buyer. Every time I put an email together to an agent, I'm guessing that there's a good chance they copy and paste it and send it to the client. So always gear your emails. Don't just leave anything on the telephone call with the broker on the other side, the agent on the other side, follow up and put it into an email and justify your case with comparative market analysis. Or like for instance, 26 G about to list the property has open views to the Hudson river central park and, um, uh, the George Washington bridge 25 G does not. So if I was, representing a buyer on that apartment, I would say, although I understand that 25G sold for one point, or I'm representing the seller, I'll, I'll stay with the seller. Although I understand that 25G sold for 1.8 million, 26G clears the building and has all this. So although that's a great comp for units 25G and below, 26 and above, it's a different ball game. And I would point out other units and that's going to get forwarded to the client. I'm helping that agent do their job. I'm helping them provide information that's going to help us to their client. Um, be creative. Um, you know, I always say that if it's not illegal, if the Department of State in New York doesn't say that it's something that we're not allowed to do, and just because it's not, you know, it's not a, a custom to do in New York, that doesn't mean we can't do it. Um, my favorite example is there's a mansion tax above 1 million in New York. So if we had something listed at a million 65, everybody would always try to get it for 995. They wanted the seller to trade 70,000 to save the buyer $10,000. So what I started doing about 10, 12 years ago was talking to sellers and saying, I know they're going to try to beat us up down to 995. Let's offer to pay the, the uh, mansion tax put it in the first line of the description, seller paying mansion tax. What does that do? It removes the negative that's gonna be used against us later. It also sets the tone that this is gonna transact over a million. And I tell the seller, let's bump up the price 1%. You're not gonna wind up paying for it. Because we're paying the mansion tax, it's gonna be more competitive and you're gonna get a higher price. So let's take the negative off the table, let's set the tone that it's gonna trade above a million. And let's put that in the first line of the, uh, of the description. Another thing that I like to do is um, in New York, our contract deposits are 10%. I don't know if that's the case out there. Probably not. We're psychopathic in a lot of ways in New York. People have to put up $200,000 with their contract on a $2 million property. If it's contingent on financing, that's one thing. If you have to waive your mortgage contingency in a competitive market and you don't get financing, you lose your job, you lose $200,000. I never thought that was fair. So everybody's putting up 10% and risking 10%. I came up with, let's put the 10% down, waive the mortgage contingency, but only put 2% at risk. So if God forbid you lose your job, you're risking 40,000 as opposed to 200,000. I've been doing that on every deal where I have to waive a mortgage contingency since we started doing it. I work with attorneys that I work with all the time, but sometimes my clients bring a different attorney to the table that I don't know. And they always say the same thing. That is incredible. That's genius. Why didn't we think of that? You know, just because it's not customary doesn't mean you can't do it. You know, as long as it's not law or as long as you're not breaking the contract, you know, try to be as creative as possible. Um, that's our job. You know, if you're just doing what everybody else does, then you're just like everybody else. We're trying to be better. So we're trying to be creative, come up with solutions for people. Um, seem cooperative even when pushing. Um, you know, again, it's like we get an offer, it's not what we want. Our offer is, you know, 1.8 million. And um, okay, sorry. Um, the offer is 1.8 million. Our property is 2.1 million. We're not saying, you know, thanks for this terrible offer. 
you know, what are you thinking? We're saying thank you so much for your offer. Um, I know you're a really good agent. I know your client wanted to come in at 1.7. Um, and I know you're aware that apartment X, apartment Y, and apartment Z all traded above 2 million. And I know, you know, I work with a lot of buyers too. I understand that we have to do what the buyer asks us to do, but I just wanted you, you know, to be aware that we're also aware that these three properties have traded above 2 million and my seller knows this as well and will transact accordingly. My seller knows this as well, as well and will transact accordingly, or my buyer knows this as well and will transact accordingly. Like use that terminology. Like we know what's up, and we're going to transact accordingly. Like, you're not pulling one over on us. The research is right here. The comps are right here. So gently point that out. Be cooperative. Um, you know, remove negatives as soon as you can. Remember the brick wall. Remember the father selling to the child. Um, this is a big one. Always stay calm. Keep the energy positive. Um, you know, your clients have enough stress on their plate. Don't go back to them. Oh my God, they're not listening to us. Go back to them and say, you know what? We're gonna try one more time with them. I think we can do it. If we can't, then what we have to prepare ourselves to do is to walk, start looking at other properties and hope that they come to their senses and, and follow us. We're not driving them crazy. We're not calling the other side idiots. We're not trying to throw gasoline in, into a small fire and create a big fire. Um, you know, I say, we're, let's be the doc. D-O-C-K, the market, the transaction is the water, our client is the boat. We're trying to hold them as close to us as possible. And we're the experts. We're the ones that are you know, guiding them through the process and we need to be cool. We need to be collected when we're, when we're dealing with them. Um, create urgency without being salesy. This is important when you've got a listing on the market for a cool 180 days. You know, how do you create urgency when you've been on the market for 180 days. And guess what? In New York, we've got some properties that have been on the market for over 100 days. Um, what do we do? We tell stories about why things have changed. We had a tenant in place. It was hard to show. The tenant has moved out. Now it's very easy to, to show. We're not making this up. We're, we're finding the story that actually fits the scenario. Um, we were priced at 1.8. The market told us the price was wrong. We've adjusted to 1.7. And now we're seeing an uptick in activity, you know, it really was the price. Or we took it off the market for a couple of weeks, we restaged the property, we painted. Now we're seeing a significant uptick in activity. You know, we're really done something that's that's attracting buyers at this point. You know, we're 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 not seeing seeming salesy, nothing like seeing in a listing description, this will not last. And then you look days on market 257. So we're not trying to be out of touch. We're trying to create some type of urgency for our clients. Um, don't be desperate, stay a little bit aloof. Unless you're representing a buyer in a bidding war, never show your hand. We're always trying to you know, be a little bit aloof, conceal your motivation. You know, don't be the person that says, we wanna be in this specific school district up to this price point, because that information, a savvy agent will use that against you, will use that against your client. So stay a little bit aloof. If at a standstill, again, I don't say take it or leave it. You lost us, we're gone. I always say the door is open until it's closed. You know, we like this property. Why are we trying to say that we're never gonna come back to this property? We lose all credibility when we come back. The door is still open. However, if we find something else and we move forward on that, the door closes. So until the door closes, you can come back to us. I'm always trying to grease the runway. I'm always trying to say the water's warm, come on in. We're not trying to be high pressure. When I first got into the business, I only worked with buyers. I was in my early 20s and I was fortunate enough to know a lot of hedge fund guys, private equity guys who were buying three, four, five million dollar places in the early 2000s, which was crazy. There was a lot of people in my office that didn't like me, even though I'm a likable guy because they didn't like that I was selling multi-million dollar properties, but I didn't work with a seller for the first two years of the business. So I was a $300,000 agent when I was working with a $300,000 buyer. I was a $5 million um, agent when I was working with you know, one of my finance guys, but it was a buyer's market. It was so hard for me to get my offers heard. I was a new guy, nobody knew me, I had no cred credibility. So what did I do? 
I ingratiated myself to the brokerage community. I figured out 95% of all listings on the Upper East Side are held by these 10 agents. 90% of all listings in Chelsea and West Village are held by these 10% of the agents. So I would go to their open houses, even if I didn't have a buyer for that specific property, and I would become friends with them. I wanted to become friends with the top agents in the neighborhoods that my clients wanted to be in. My young finance guys who were single, they all, all wanted to be in the West Village in Chelsea. So I became friends with the agents that had the best inventory. The Upper East Side was a little harder because there were some agents that had been in the business for 50 years who they didn't want to become my friend. <laughs> and I learned, at a, at a, this is what taught me that negotiation should be amicable, that real estate should be amicable because those agents were pushing us away. I had the buyer, the buyers who you know, were having their, their first kids, they were trying to build their family, they were trying to get to the good school districts on the Upper East Side, and the agents didn't want to hear it. So that really sculpted the way that I do business. I, you know, we can have a ton of listings, we can have competitive properties, but we're not pushing anybody away. We're, even in a bidding war where we have 10 properties, we're not saying, you're the 11th off. When they ask, we say, you know, we've got a lot of interest. We're getting some offers. We're probably going to go to best and final. But let me tell you, I've been doing this a long time. It's not always the sales price, the offer price. We have co-ops. It's, sometimes it's about the financial picture. Sometimes the seller is attracted to a certain profile. I encourage you to put your offer in because we don't know what the criteria is that's going to have the seller decide to pick that person. So what did we do? We got them in, now they're invested, now they're gonna come up once we go to best and final. We're not trying to push people away saying, oh, we have 10 offers, let's not encourage people to come in. Why would we not want as many offers as possible? Then we have a, a pick of the litter. We don't know that that 11th person isn't gonna be the person that now that they feel really invested, they're gonna come up 15%. So we're always trying to get more people involved um, we're never trying to be high pressure. We're always trying to be low pressure. Um, so, you know, again, who do we negotiate with? We negotiate with our buyers. We negotiate with our sellers. We negotiate with the people that we're going to hopefully be in a transaction with. And we do it as soon as our first contact with these people. Assume every person that makes an appointment is the buyer. Assume every property that you're going to go to is the property that your buyer is going to want and act as if you would, you know, act like you know that that's the property when you're making the appointment. So when you're making it for a buyer and the property is asking 800,000 and there's no comp above 750, gently point that out when you're making the appointment. Say, you know, we'd love to see this property at 7 p.m. or 7 p.m. At 5 p.m. on Tuesday, hopefully not 7 p.m., 5 p.m. on Tuesday. And, you know, a quick question before we confirm the appointment. I noticed that all the comps are under 750. Is there something about this property that I'm missing? So we're gently planting the seeds for future negotiation. You know, let them explain to us why they're at 800. They're probably going to say, you know what, we're a little overpriced, but, you know, they will come down. Whatever it is, they're going to tell you something. So we're asking questions, assuming that that's the person that's going to buy the property or that's the property that your buyer is going to pursue. Um, always, you know, never think, oh, it's just another buyer. It's just another, you know, listing. It's always the one that we're going to eventually pursue and treat every scenario as if it's going to be the one that you're going to pursue. Um, again, negotiation begins at first contact and then real estate transactions should seem amicable. They should never be the boardroom fighting with each other. Guys, your biggest, um, the biggest thing you bring to the table that your clients don't have is relationships with the brokerage community. Your clients don't have that. You need to nurture your relationships with your clients. We're in competition when we're going after a listing for about five minutes. Once you get the listing, they're no longer your competition. They're your asset and they should be treated as such. Strong relationships in the brokerage community is the best thing you can do for the longevity of your business. When I have 10 offers and there's one of the agents I've done five deals with, 
and I know that they're really good at their job and they pre-qualify their clients, guess who I'm gonna give a little bit more information to? Guess who I'm naturally, even if I'm not doing it consciously, who am I unconsciously going to try to get to the finish line first? The person who's shown me that they can get to the closing table. And that's on you to demonstrate that to the brokerage community that you get to the closing table. So we're never trying to, even if we win a negotiation, we never want the other side to feel like they've lost. Remember when I said never lie? One caveat, we stretch one time. In a best and final bidding situation, whoever came in first place, we always tell them, you just squeaked out the victory. You just, you literally, you're so good at this. You got the, uh, you know, you, you beat out the second place by a hair. I don't care if a hair is 200,000. You do not want that person to think that they overpaid by $200,000. That is the one time, and that's part of being amicable and never making people feel, you never laud it over people. Oh, we got you to pay all this at the closing table. You know, at the closing table, you want them to thank you for a good transaction. So with clients, we're telling stories of past successes. I'm a storyteller, I'll tell you a story. This is a brochure I bring on every listing appointment I ever go on. Why this one? It's not my highest price. It's not the most glamorous apartment. It was an unrenovated two bedroom on the top floor of a building in Gramercy, actually right around the corner from me here. And um, my aunt owned an art gallery in New York City for 30 years. The gentleman who owned this property was 96. And I think he'd been buying stuff from my aunt for 30 years because every corner of his apartment was covered in paintings. He had sculptures everywhere. He painted his walls burgundy, painted his ceiling gray. Um, and his daughter, who's a famous Hollywood producer, was there when I got there. And I did my homework, always do your homework. I knew who the building expert was. I knew who did 95% of the deals in the building, this woman, Elaine. And I knew I was going against her. You'd be foolish not to know who the neighborhood expert is, guys. You need to know who's the person doing the most business in that building so that you can be prepared to compete against somebody that you know, as opposed to competing against somebody that you don't know who they are. So I went in and the daughter said, Seth, sorry for wasting your time. We really wanted to, your aunt had recommended you and we just you know, wanted to you know, do the right thing and get you over here. But my father has already decided to use somebody else. I said, let me guess, Elaine? She said, of course, yeah, Elaine. And I said, oh, I, I know Elaine, she's fantastic. Flattery, again, we're not disparaging people. We're not saying, oh, they're terrible. That's, that, again, that may look like your self-interest. We're now asking about what is she doing for you? How is she going to help you? So I said, Elaine is great. What, what price did she put on this property? 1.4. I said, ooh, 1.4. In this current condition, I think we can do 1.5. There's no reason that you can't get 1.5 for a two bedroom co-op in Gramercy with these views. Yes, the kitchen needs a renovation. Yes, the flooring needs to be repaired, but this is 1600 square feet in Gramercy, or sorry, 1400 square feet, whatever, whatever it was. It was a big apartment, two bedroom, top floor in need of everything. It needed an $800,000 renovation. That's why it wasn't 2.4 million. So, um, I said, I think 1.5 is certainly attainable, but 1.6 if we just thin the apartment out and paint it white. I don't think that you need to do a complete staging because there's enough nice stuff in this apartment, there's just too much of it. Let's take that out. They wound up giving me a call and saying, Seth, we wanna hire you. We like the 1.6 that you've offered, that you said we can get, and the daughter, myself and the super, we staged the apartment ourselves. We got somebody to come help get things out, put it in storage. We moved some things around. We brought in my painter who did me a favor, $11,000 paint job. We got my photographer and I use a luxury photographer for every listing, whether it's 300,000 or whether it's 20 million because our listings are our resume. We never know who's in the building that has a $10 million listing in the same building that has a $1 million listing. We treat every listing as if it's a $20 million listing. We never skimp on any listings. Business begets business. So we bring in our great photographer. 
we now have the place thinned out, views all the way to Long Island, and I look on the computer the day before listing, and I see we're the only two bedroom under two million. I called Helen, the daughter, and I said, Helen, I wanna go for 1.7. She said, Seth, I've bought and sold 25 pieces of property in my life, and I've never had somebody ask to raise the price, always lower the price. I said, Helen, trust me, I really think that we have something here now. The pictures look fantastic. We got everybody in, first open house, Lo and behold, who shows up? Elaine, the building expert, with a client. And in front of everybody at the open house, she goes, this is so overpriced, it will never sell. You know, we talked about Google, Google before. So Google is in Chelsea. This is Gramercy. Gramercy and Chelsea, east and west, same level in the city. Um, at the open house, a guy comes in, talking to him. He's a uh, new hire for Google, just moved out from the west coast. And he doesn't want to be in Chelsea. He's got small kids. Chelsea's just not a neighborhood for his kids. Gramercy's got the good schools. He wanted to be in Gramercy. I found out his budget was $2 million. I said to him, you know, are you working with an agent? He said, yes. I said, I'd like to talk to your agent because I think that you need to get this property. It really, there's so much potential here. I called his agent and I said, we are the only two bedroom under $2 million in Gramercy. This is such a deal. You're gonna put some money into this and you're gonna create a two and a half, $3 million apartment. However, we've had so much interest in this that I think it's gonna go above ask and I'd like to see you guys get it. So I'm giving you a little insight here. Got an offer of 1.75. We closed at 1.75. So why do I take this with me? Because this is a roadmap to why you should stage. This is a roadmap of why you should listen to my price opinion and this is well, first and foremost, why you should hire me, but also why you don't necessarily need to use the neighborhood expert or the building expert. And what do I say when I go into a building in New York City, I always know that there's a neighborhood building expert that they're talking to. So unless I'm the building expert, I'm gonna say the same thing every time. I'm gonna tell this story and then I'm gonna say, and guys, this is gold for when you're competing with the neighborhood expert or the building expert, always say this, the building expert is tied to the most recent trades in this building. The buyers who are looking at property are not only looking in this building, they may not only be looking in this neighborhood, they may not even be only looking in this borough. So you want somebody that understands the totality of the inventory on the market and the dynamics of different market segments so that they can understand how to convey value and maximize the offer from a potential prospective buyer. The building or neighborhood expert is only tied to three comps, four comps. We're looking at this big giant picture. And if I was only looking at what had sold in this building, I would have priced it at 1.4. We would have left 25% on the table. Do not make that mistake. The building expert, they've got a great business because everybody calls them. They don't have to sharpen their skills. They don't have to understand the totality of the market, but I do. So that's why we tell stories about our successes, about other people's successes, put the breadcrumbs to get them to do what's ultimately best for them, which is hire you, because you're gonna get them the most money and obviously you want the business. So um, real estate transactions should be amicable. We're not beating people over the head. We're gently, bringing our clients along and we're gently pointing out when the agent on the other side made an offer that's too low. We're not saying, hey, stupid, 1.7 is a terrible offer. It has to be above two. What are you, an idiot? We're never saying that. First of all, we would never say that. But second of all, that's gonna make them recoil. We wanna make them come towards us. So we're gonna say, thank you so much for this, you know, for the offer, I understand your client has an attachment to this property um, based on X, Y, and Z. We understand that the value for this property is at least 2 million and my seller understands that and will transact accordingly. Please let me know if I can supply any comparative market analysis that you can share with your client. You know, maybe, maybe they're missing something. So can I share the market pulse? Can I share the average price per square foot? Can I show you a couple properties that have sold recently? Nine out of 10 times, 
not a se not a really seasoned agent. They're not going to take your comps, but somebody relatively new, they're going to allow you to do the work for them. So you're going to be able to paint the picture that's going to help you achieve your goal. Um, you know, so how do we negotiate from a position of strength without seeming like we're strong arming? Again, you know, we're, you know, using flattery. I promise you, you know, they say flattery goes a long way. It really does. We're telling people, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, even when we know that they're probably not aware. Um, with clients, we're telling stories. We're not beating them over the head. Um, with agents, as I'm sure you're aware, as you already know, um, turn the other side into an agent working for you like we just talked about. Give them the information that they're going to pass on to their client. I call it conspiratorial consensus. A lot of times the agent, especially if they're a little bit newer, and you say, you know, I really want you guys to get this property, it's not going to happen at 1.7. I can promise you that. If you want to do what's best for your client, you're going to need to get them up above 1.8. Let me know anything I can do. You know, like make it conspiratorial, even though you're not doing anything that, you know, um, against your client's fiduciary interest, have a conspiratorial tone. It, it truly works. Um, again, anticipate what's going to be used against you and take it off the table first. And then, um, you know, ultimately we're in the business of making offers and we're in the business of receiving offers. So now it gets fun. <laughs> everything else was sort of, and I'll, and I'll do this pretty quick, but everything else is sort of the, the construct of negotiation. It's the musts, it's the style, but tactically we're doing specific things when we're making an offer. So in New York, we have the real estate board of New York form that we're filling out with all offers that has the financials, what percent financing, all that stuff. But what am I doing? I'm putting a cover letter to that. And my cover letter in bold says what the offering price is, what percent is financed, if it's contingent, whether or not it's cash, pre-approved, um, all that kind of stuff. And I'm doing that so that the agent doesn't have to come back to me and ask me questions about the offer. When I get an offer that's incomplete, I assume it's a newer agent and I assume that I'm gonna be able to help them with the transaction help them get to the price that we want. So we're not only making the offer complete and professional because it's the right thing to do, but we're also putting forth some strength. It's a firewall against them thinking that you're not, you know, a uh, seasoned proficient agent. So what do I do? I type up the email. Do I press send? No. Don't hide behind email. Don't hide behind text. You never get information unless you're on the telephone. We unfortunately don't get to negotiate in person. That would be the best. Telephone is the second best. So we pick up the phone. We call Joe Broker. And do I press send? No. I wait till I get them on the phone. And I say, hey, Joe, um, is this a good time? Oh, it is? Okay, great. Did you get that offer I sent over? Click. Why do I do that? Because then Joe Broker is going to read the offer back to me every time, every single time. They're going to say, okay, the offer is 1.65, 27% cash, pre-approved for a loan in excess of the remainder, contingent on financing, closing three months out, you know, whatever it is, you're going to hear the pain point. Then you go back to your buyer and you say, hey, Mary, I don't think that we need to come up much in price, but we may have to get creative with a mortgage contingency. And that's when I explain to them, you know, typically 10% deposit is in, in jeopardy if you waive your mortgage contingency, but let's be creative. Let's offer 1% and be willing to settle at 2%. That way you're not putting your full deposit, but we're learning information by getting them on the phone. Um, when we're making an offer or sorry, receiving an offer for a seller, all the agents these days just want to press send on an email. I reach out to them and I call. They don't pick up, I send them a text and I say, I need to talk to you. My seller wants me to speak with an agent before presenting their offer. My seller wants me to speak to the agent before presenting the offer. So that I'm explaining to them that I'm not gonna present this offer until I speak to them. So they're gonna pick up the phone and call me or they're gonna answer when I call them next. Because I wanna learn stuff before I talk to my seller. 
So I'm going to call my seller and I'm or sorry, call the agent on the other side. And I'm going to say, thank you so much for the offer. Um, you know, we really liked your, your, your buyers and we think they'd be a great fit for this property. I see you made the offer at 1.65. Interesting. I'm not going to say anything else until they did. Or if interesting doesn't come natural to you saying, I see you made the offer of 1.65. Okay. Whatever it is, create an awkward silence. I, this is my favorite thing that I do because people do the same thing every time. When I, when I press send on the offer for a buyer, they always read it back to me. When I say interesting, they always give me a piece of information. There's good information and there's bad information. Not all negotiations are going to be ones that you can be super victorious in, but you at least need to know who you're dealing with. So they're gonna say, yeah, 1.65. They've actually made offers three other places. And whoever is the person that's gonna, you know, give them what they want is the person they're gonna transact with. We're in a buyer's market right now. Our sellers oftentimes aren't getting offers for two, three months. So now I can go to my seller and I can say, yeah, it's a little low, but they've got offers three other places. If you really want to transact, you know, we're not going to be able to get them up to the 1.8 that you wanted, but we have to make a decision. Do you want to negotiate with these people? Or they might say, you know, this is a much better thing to hear, but we don't always hear the optimal thing, but we're going to get information. And they're oftentimes going to tell us it's an opening offer. You know, they just wanted to start the negotiation. Um, we look forward to uh, a counter. Then I can go back to my seller and I can say, you know, don't be offended by this offer. It's an opening offer. People negotiate differently. You know, I've been to India multiple times. I negotiated on large gemstone parcels and we start so far apart, but we always find the common ground. Or, you know, there's certain, people that come very close and then they don't move much. Everybody negotiates differently, but what we know is that they're willing to come up. So we have good information. So, you know, always get people over the phone, on the phone, never, never just pass the offer along to your seller without finding out some information. Like you're, you're doing a disservice if you don't find out some information. So, um, you know, obviously there's seller's markets and there's buyer's markets. When you're working with a seller in a seller's market, really fun. When you're working with a buyer in a seller's market, not as much fun, but this is where your skill set really adds value to your client. Um, when you're in a buyer's market, working with buyers is amazing. Working with sellers can be really frustrating. So what do we do? When we're in a seller's market working for sellers, we say, I would love to do a deal with you, but we need... Um, you know, we do have interest, but please come in. What we're trying to do is we're trying to keep the door open. We've alluded to this earlier. Um, when there's a, a bidding situation on your property, you're not trying to push people away, but you're trying to let them know that there is a lot of interest. We don't want them to think, oh, I'm going to come in 20% under ask. We want them to know that there's interest. We have offers, but we haven't come to any conclusions and there's still a lot of opportunity to get this apartment. Um, for a buyer in a seller's market, this is when your relationships in the industry really come in handy. You're gonna say to the agent on the other side, you know, my buyer really wants this home. You will see us at the closing table. We will get you to the closing table. So you're trying to convey that your buyer is serious. You're trying to convey that your buyer will get to the closing table. That is all you can do. When you're going into a bidding war with a buyer, have a top number. If the property is asking 1 million and your buyer's top number is 1.1, know that. That way, if they lose the property, somebody spent more than the value of the property. Somebody else overpaid. They didn't lose that person that overpaid lost. And that makes them feel better going to the next property. Don't make it a guessing game. Come up with a, with a strategy before you go into a best and final, before you go into a bidding war know what your top number is. That way, at least they put their best foot forward. Um, in a buyer's market, you know, this is when having a buyer in a, in a buyer's market right now. So for instance, I've got a guy in Florida 
We just went into contract on his property. I'm co-listing it down in Florida for 3 million. He's coming up with a budget of 6 million. 6 million is so much fun right now in New York City because we're going to get to um, developers who are asking 8 million. We're going to try to get it for 6 million. We're going to try to throw it in a parking spot. We're going to try to get them to pay the common charges for a year. This is really fun. But when you're the seller in a buyer's market, it's a lot less fun. Um, you need to figure out what motivates who you're talking to and connect to their, you know, it's the same, it's, it's the same thing. We're trying to figure out what motivates them. Um, so when you're representing the seller in a buyer's market, I use things like, I beat up my seller for you. I did a lot of the negotiating upfront. We know we're in a buyer's market. So we did the negotiating for you. You know, we're trying to create a firewall. Um, identify strength of that particular micro market. I know we're in a buyer's market, but actually in Chelsea, 76% is in contract. So, you know, although the financial district is a real opportunity, blue chip neighborhoods like Chelsea are, you know, we're still seeing some competition. You know, we understand it's not 2016, but we do also understand where the market is here. And my seller understands it and will transact accordingly. So, um, you know, that's, that's huge. Um, again, commission we talked about, local experts, staging. The hardest one is the friend or family member. So about 40% of my business is referred to me by other agents. I'm used to paying referral fees. I'm trying to create a win-win. So when someone tells me that their family friend or their cousin is a real estate agent, I say, are they a full-time real estate agent? You know, are they selling 100 homes a year? What, what kind of market savvy do they have? And they'll say, you know what? They're not selling 100 homes a year, but I really can't upset my wife's first cousin. And I say, what if I can help you create a win-win? I don't typically negotiate commission, but I want to represent you because I want you to be in the most capable hands. I'm willing to pay a referral fee to your um, wife's first cousin or your husband's neighbor from childhood because I want them to have a good relationship with you. We're giving them free money not to mess up your transaction. So we get to protect your relationship. They get money. They don't have the pressure of having to perform for you. They don't have the potential outcome of jeopardizing a, a relationship. And you're going to be in the most capable hands possible. So I'm perfectly fine with giving a referral fee to get the listing. Business begets business. I will give away 25%, but I'm also able to give 3% to the buyer's agent because I believe that offering the full commission to the buyer's agent will attract the most interest to your property. So we're creating a win-win-win. The buyer's agent's not getting shortchanged. I'm getting the listing. The seller's getting you know, a very capable agent versus a part-timer and they're able to maintain their relationship and the friend or family member is able to get, you know, a referral fee for, for basically doing nothing. So that was the hardest one for me. Commission is so easy. Local expert is the easiest for me. Staging is pretty easy. Friend or family, as good as I think I am in negotiating, I couldn't win that more often than I lost it. So I just changed strategies. And now I'm getting probably 75% of those, where I probably was getting 10% of those. Because 90% of the time, they're not just gonna screw over their friend or family. So that's a win-win that we can create. Then finally, um, and then I will open it up to a few questions. Um, and I know that I'm going a little bit over time, but be creative. We talked about it a little bit before. Offer to pay the mansion tax when representing a seller, whatever that means in your market. Um, we have the mortgage contingency, but make it 2% instead of 10. Um, so I went to my friend Sumesh's wedding in India in 2007. This is one of my favorite stories about being creative. Um, one of his best friends who he grew up in Zambia with was one of the creators of vitamin water. Um, perhaps you've seen this guy on TV. Um, and my friend said to me, he was like, Seth, he's working with an agent in New York, but he's got a budget of like 10, 12 million. In 2007, that was a huge budget. It's still a huge budget, but in 2007, we didn't have the 50 million, $100 million properties in New York. Unfortunately, I don't get to play in that arena so much, 
you know, 18 million is the highest I've gone. But, you know, now that $10 million budget would be the equivalent of like a $30 million budget in New York because the luxury market shot up so much. That's why our luxury market is so weak because it shot up too quick. Um, so I kept trying to find a moment. I was like dancing near him, trying to like go up to him when he was at the bar. Finally, on the day three of a five day wedding, I got a chance to talk to him. I explained to him that, you know, Sumesh is one of my best friends. He's one of your best friends. I really care. I've been doing this for X amount of time. I'm gonna help you achieve the best possible value for your purchase. He winds up hiring me. We go into contract on a $10 million property in Chelsea, uh, Tribeca, entire 17th floor of a, of a building, new construction, not gonna be complete until 2009. What happened prior to that thing uh, going into uh, getting closed on? Lehman Brothers, financial collapse, he had a 15% deposit down, 1.5 million. And he called me and said, Seth, I'm willing to lose that deposit to not throw good money behind bad money. And I said, I don't know anyone who's ever opened up a contract and renegotiated, but let me talk to the developer, see what I can do. We got that thing for 7 million and it closed. But we didn't get it for 7 million on paper. We got a decorator credit of a million dollars. We got a $500,000 parking garage. We got common charges paid for two years. Developers want to protect the optics of their price. Resale sellers only care about the number. They don't need to be creative. They're selling their house and they're moving. It's their neighbor's problem that they only got 750,000. A developer, he you know, trades 10% down on, a, on, a, on the first closing. It signals to everybody else that the property is worth 10% less. He has 400 units. That 10% over a $400 million sellout is $40 million. He doesn't want to negotiate $40 million to help you save $100,000. So you have to put yourself in the motivation of the person you're talking to and understand, go after taxes paid for three years with a, with a developer, with a home builder, you know, who's got 40 homes in a neighborhood, get them to pay for a parking spot get them to pay your HOA for three years. Understand that it's more important for them to protect the optics and, you know, take advantage of different performing parts of the market. You know, that's the last way to be creative. Like my friend Liz, Elizabeth, and I talked about before, don't pigeonhole yourself into it's a buyer or seller's market. Figure out and dissect, you know, especially with luxury finance people, you know, really high end, smart, savvy people like if you can show them this is a way to take advantage of the market where everybody else is running they love to take advantage when other people are running away so if you can find opportunity for them that's where you you know you win the client and then once you win that luxury client you usually win as friends because they all like to use the same person they like to share they use the same financial analyst they use the same landscaper they use the same travel agent if that's still a thing um, you know, they use the same real estate agent. So, um, you know, get that piece of business by being creative. And that's pretty much it. Well, Seth, that was amazing. I took a bunch of notes and I hope everybody else did as well. I, I love that you came into this culture and you emulate the KW culture very much by repeating over and over again, the win-win and, and, and not creating animosity. I think that's something we can all learn from and we just so appreciate your time. Um, I know we've gone over, but if anybody has a question for Seth, we can hang on for just a minute if you have a moment, Seth. Uh, sure, no problem. So I will say that not only did I emulate the KW culture, it actually was a culture that spoke to who I've always been, which is why I've been very comfortable in this ecosystem more so than in my other ecosystem where I remember being at a top producer event in Miami where they took the top hundred people from the company and the chairman of the company, I walked up and he actually turned and put his back to me and was talking to somebody, uh, you know, who was actually trying to introduce him to me. And I remember thinking to myself, this is not my place. Like oh. it's not my place. I've been fortunate enough to be in a couple of Gary's uh, masterminds, luxury masterminds and very different type of person and, and culture comes from the top. And I think that it's, uh, you know, it's been very transparent since I've come over. 
Absolutely. Well, we're so happy that you're with us. Um, does anybody have any questions for Seth? I'm seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat box for you. I was going to say lots of positive comments, and I'm so glad that we recorded this because we will post this. Seth, I, I took a million notes as well, and um, oh, I was very happy to see that. <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, I'm I'm telling you, um, so much great information. So thank you. Let's see. Yeah. I mean, that, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I have a whole notebook <laughs> full of <laughs> notes. Yep, lots of thank yous. Lots of thank yous. Uh oh, Dana's <laughs> question. We have one question here. What marketing for new business do you do around current listings? What does that look like for you, Seth? Okay, so, you know, we want to get two buyers and one listing out of every listing. That's, that's our goal. So I always do the first open house myself for any price point. So remember when I said we had the, it was actually a four, I said 300, but I think it was $400,000 at the same time we had an $18 million listing. Right. I didn't show the $18 million listing. I did the $400,000 open house because business begets business. We want to meet the people. I got not only another listing in the building, I not only sold it, but I got an $8 million listing from, from that listing. So open houses should be not only a way to sell property, but to get listings. We do just listed cards, mm -hmm. we sold cards. We do remember when we sold cards. Remember when we asked you if you remembered that we sold cards. Like, I mean, we really go after it. Um, I started having my clients write testimonial letters because we're in a vertical market that we send to everybody in the building mm -hmm. and we send to in buildings that have similar price points within the building. We don't send a luxury condo, a middle of the market co-op, but we look for the other co-ops around and we mail those. Um, oftentimes my clients say, Seth, can you write the letter? I'm really good at writing that testimonial letter about myself. I've gotten really good at it. I'm sure you guys can do it as well. Um, you know, they always talk about how I was so respectful of their schedule, how my negotiation tact, got them top dollar, how they, I was communicative during the entire process. Um, we also like to have somebody on our team circle prospect from tele, on the telephone. It's a little harder in New York because our co-ops, oftentimes the owners are not public record. It's a little easier with our condos, um, but we want someone to circle prospect. I'm not a cold caller. I wish I was actually. Um, you know, we talked about earlier, like the golf swing. I'm, I've developed too many habits. It's hard for me to pick up a phone and call somebody I don't, I don't know anymore because I've been doing it for so long this way, but I'm really good at calling my database. I speak to them all the time. I speak to 10 people in my database, 10 of my real people every day. Yeah. I come up with ideas for people before they ask. Um, I notice that somebody's in a segment of the market that's performing really well and there's other segments of the market that are performing poorly. I'll say to them, did you ever think about selling your place in a buyer's market, in a seller's market, and buying something in a, in a, in a buyer's market? You know, taking advantage of that. So we're trying to be creative. We're reaching out to our people. But um, testimonial letters were the biggest breakthrough that I came up with. Because when you send a postcard, it's obviously from you. When a testimonial letter gets sent from the seller mm. to their neighbors that ideally they know, that means a lot. It's not self-promotion. It's somebody who wants to share with their neighbors. Love that. Somebody else bragging on you. That's awesome. Exactly. exactly. Looks like we have uh, two more quick questions for you. Who's been your greatest influencer? As far as in my business, the people that have promoted me or my biggest influence? If Patsy's still on, you can clarify. Both. <laughs> so, you know, my business up until 2017, when the luxury segment started faltering in New York, has been like 90% luxury from 2007 to 2017. So I would always say that there's three people. Um, my buddy, uh, Saul, who uh, owns a huge law firm. He's the, you know, it's his name on the door. It's in like five different places 
upstate New York, New Jersey, Westchester, Long Island, Connecticut. Um, his brother-in-law is a billionaire. I sold his brother's place to Daniel Radcliffe. And then I sold him a place that was owned by Robert De Niro. I mean, he's put me in these amazing mm. situations. Then my friend Subesh, I've been to Indian weddings in Dubai, in Thailand, in Mauritius, in Africa, in India multiple times, all over the world. And I've always come back with at least like one $5 million buyer. So he's been really good to my, for my business. And then my brother, who's a general counsel, publicly traded companies, has really connected me with a lot of really amazing people. So it's not as if every piece of business came from one of those three, but they put me in touch with somebody that got me into a building that I otherwise would not have been in. So I think when you're in the middle of the market, it's a grenade. You're trying to touch as many people. When it's in luxury, you're being a sniper. You're trying to figure out who has the most influence themselves. So you're trying to connect to a branch, sorry, a trunk that has a million branches of, of people that have a lot of connectivity. Um, when you're talking about the middle of the market, you know, we're always trying to establish new relationships. But in luxury, it's really tough to break into a group. So you're trying to find someone that has great connectivity to a larger sphere that has a lot of faith in you that will actually be an advocate for you. Not somebody that if they're asked, they'll mention you, but somebody that's proactively talking about you everywhere they go. And for me, it's really been three people that has sort of sustained 15 years of working in, in luxury. It comes down to three people. Um, and then, um, I mean, you guys are in Gary Keller's Market Center. I didn't even know what lead generation was until I came over to Keller Williams. So like, I would say the biggest influence on me in the last four and a half years is Keller Williams. Um, I've changed so much. Um, I fired admins because they didn't fit into what we wanna do in the Keller Williams model. Um, I think John May might be on this call, our new, our new admin, um, you know, he worked for another team um, in Keller Williams. He had a, um, a uh, hospitality background. You know, we're looking for different things since coming over because we're, we're, we're servicing our business different. It's not that we're only, we're not changing the way we service our clients, although it's more systematized, but we're changing the way we're servicing our business. And that comes from Keller Williams. I didn't, I had teams prior to uh, coming over to Keller Williams. I actually fired my business partner my first year at Keller Williams. I have a new business partner who was an unnamed partner in the old team because one was willing to adjust and systematize and get into the model and one wasn't. And I mean, we're, we're in New York and we're fighting off our back a little bit because of, you know, some, some, you know, January, February, early March was amazing in New York. And then obviously COVID has changed things and I'm anticipating probably two years before we're fully back to where we were March 9th. March 13th, I lost 11 transactions. We fell apart. We had an average price of 2 million per transaction. We got a couple of those people back. One is a $4 million. Those people disappeared. So we're gonna be fighting off our back, but we're building something that's repeatable, systematic, and yes, we didn't know anything about this stuff before coming over. Amazing. Wow, well, well that was incredible. I think we're all so excited to hear that that was such a big influence on you because we're all here for good reason, right? Um, well, I, I wanted to just say again from all of our leadership team that we are just so grateful to have you here. I'm sure the agents who've all said thank you on the chat as well are just so appreciative of your time, Seth. And we look forward to, to hearing you speak some more. We hope to see you on some panels. I'll make sure everybody gets your contact information. If you guys have any business in New York City, we'd love to send some Seth's way. And uh, Seth, anything else you want to say before we close out for today? Um, so I'm finally looking through and I see some, some familiar faces. So it's nice to see you guys. Um, we, um, you know, we service Manhattan. We service Brooklyn, we service Queens, and we service Long Island. And um, here are some of my our contacts. Um, my email is seth at levincong.com. Here's our Facebook, our website, our Instagram. And if it would be at all possible, um, 
if we can get a list of people that were on this call, um, John will be following up with a, uh, with a survey and it would just be great to stay connected with everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. We had everybody register for the call. So we have a list um, for you and we're excited that we'll all be connected. And again, thank you so much for your time, Seth. We're so appreciative. It's my pleasure. Thank you, so much. Thank you Seth. That was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And to everybody else who listened, I did record. Um, and Seth, I'll share that with you and John as well. So y'all have a recording of this and uh, lots of great nuggets that you guys can all go back to. Um, thank you again for participating in our KW Austin One uh, learning series that we'll be doing at the end of every month. So stay tuned for what's happening in September. Right. Thank you Thanks, guys so much. Thank you, Seth. Thank Bye. You.